U.S. Navy Corpsman John Bailey, alongside thousands of the U.S.'s most elite Marines, braced for yet another landing in the seemingly endless American island hopping campaign in the Pacific. This time, their target was the tiny island of Peleliu, edging closer than ever to the Japanese home islands. The Marines had executed similar operations dozens of times with remarkable success. They had perfected the formula. First, the massive US naval guns would unleash three days of relentless bombardment on the island. Then, the Marines would land to sweep away whatever remained. General William Rupertus, the commander orchestrating the landings, confidently predicted they would capture Peleliu in a quote, two to three days. However, when Bailey disembarked on Peleliu aboard their battered Amtraks on September 15, 1944, he sensed an ominous shift. The Japanese resistance on the beaches was unexpectedly light. The Marines secured the beaches in just over a day, yet as they ventured inland, the Japanese sprang their lethal trap. Emerging from Peleliu's lush hills, caves and ridges, the Japanese mounted a fierce, coordinated defense, unlike anything the Marines had encountered. In secrecy, Japan had transformed Peleliu's rugged landscape into a labyrinth of heavily fortified bunkers and fortifications, stretching across the island and converging on Umurbrogol Mountain, a veritable fortress. Days turned into weeks. The Marines found themselves ensnared in a horrifying fever dream. They fought for every inch, delving into Japanese-infested caves and ridges where they faced entrapment, isolation and ambushes, with only muzzle flashes piercing the darkness. Casualties mounted at an unprecedented rate from enemy fire, as well as illness, dehydration and starvation. As ammunition dwindled in the labyrinthine ridges and hills of Peleliu, the Marines resorted to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat against relentless waves of Japanese soldiers. This was the conflict John Bailey would label, quote, the horror of all battles, and history would remember as the most brutal battle ever faced by the US Marines. By late February 1944, the tides of war in the Pacific were unmistakably turning. In a relentless advance, Allied forces had successfully captured the Marshall Islands, setting their sights next on the Marianas. It was on June 15th that a massive force of 20,000 US troops descended upon Saipan. The battle for Saipan was ferocious. In a display of tenacious resistance, the Japanese fought with unwavering determination. However, their efforts could not withstand the Allied onslaught. By July 9th, Saipan was firmly in Allied hands, a significant victory swiftly followed by the capture of the neighboring islands of Tinian and Guam by late August. Each passing day, Japan's defensive perimeter, their so-called absolute national defense zone, was being eroded. The rapid loss of ground sent ripples of desperation through the Japanese command. The situation grew increasingly dire, leading to a grim shift in tactics, embracing suicide attacks as a desperate measure against the Allied forces, whose traditional military superiority was overwhelming. The end of the Pacific War loomed on the horizon, palpable to all, including the beleaguered Japanese forces, Yet for the soldiers of the Empire, surrender was anathema. As the Allies tightened their grip around the Japanese home territories, a sense of inevitable doom settled over the Pacific theater. In this climate of impending victory, Admiral Chester Nimitz's Pacific fleet targeted its next objective, the Palau Islands in the Western Carolines, a critical stepping stone roughly 500 miles east of the Philippines. The foremost target was Peleliu, an island modest in size but immense in strategic value, spanning merely five square miles. Seizing Palau was pivotal for the Allied war effort. It boasted one of the largest airstrips in the region. This strategic asset could enable Japanese aerial raids on surrounding islands. However, the significance of Peleliu transcended its airstrip. Its capture was a linchpin in the broader strategy for victory in the Pacific. Two proposed plans vied for implementation. General Douglas MacArthur advocated for recapturing the Philippines, then seizing Okinawa and ultimately launching an assault on the Japanese home islands. In contrast, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz proposed bypassing the Philippines entirely, capturing Okinawa and Taiwan as launch pads for an assault on the Japanese mainland, culminating in the invasion of Japan's southern islands. Both strategies converged on the necessity of invading Peleliu, albeit for different reasons. Ultimately, it was MacArthur's strategy that prevailed. The first step, neutralizing the Palau Islands, specifically Peleliu and Angar. 
Establishing an airfield there was imperative to safeguard MacArthur's left flank in his ambitious campaign to retake the Philippines. The strategic imperative of capturing the Palau group, nestled within the Caroline Islands, was clear. It was a critical move to secure the right flank of General MacArthur's forthcoming operations in the Philippines, simultaneously breaching Japan's second line of defense. By occupying Palau, the Allies would tighten their grip on the approaches to Japan's home islands. Consequently, the Joint Chiefs of Staff issued an order for the Marianas Palau operation. However, the intense combat on Saipan and the consequent demand for reinforcements led to the original plan known as Stalemate. General MacArthur remained undeterred by dissent within Navy ranks, notably from Admiral William Halsey. Halsey had argued that the island could be effectively isolated with airstrikes and naval blockades, suggesting that the Marines' talents would be better deployed in invading the Philippines. Despite this, MacArthur convinced Admiral Chester Nimitz of the operation's indispensability. Tasked with the land assault was the 1st Marine Division. After what had become a customary days-long bombardment, they were to storm Palaliu. General William Rupertus, commander of the 1st Marine Division, was brimming with confidence. He assured both his troops and superiors that the island would fall into American hands within a mere, quote, two to three days. The Army's 81st Infantry Division was designated as backup. However, Rupertus, with a dismissive view of the Army, was sure his Marines would triumph single-handedly. American intelligence on Peleliu's Japanese defenses was alarmingly sparse. The Japanese had been masters of Palau since 1920, under a League of Nations mandate, severely limiting pre-war intelligence. The Allies were blind to the extent of fortifications, particularly in the island's verdant heart. Aerial reconnaissance impeded by dense foliage offered only glimpses of the Japanese tunneling efforts. The accurate scale of the fortifications, especially within the towering Umabrogol Massif, remained cloaked in mystery. This gap in intelligence fostered a dangerous sense of optimism within the 1st Marine Division. Veterans of the markedly different battles of Guadalcanal and Cape Gloucester readied for what they presumed would be a routine encounter. Unbeknownst to them, they stood on the precipice of an ordeal so harrowing it would later be likened to the closest thing to hell on Earth. In 1944, Peleliu was a daunting stronghold under the command of Colonel Kunio Nakagawa, leader of the 10,000-strong 14th Infantry Division of the Imperial Japanese Army. The island had undergone months of systematic fortification, transforming it into a bastion bristling with 81mm and 150mm mortars and 20mm anti-aircraft cannons. This vast arsenal was further bolstered by light tanks and anti-aircraft units. The Japanese military re-evaluated their defense tactics after crushing defeats in the Solomons, Gilberts, Marshalls and Marianas Islands. Abandoning their prior strategy of halting Allied forces on the beaches with overwhelming Banzai charges, a tactic perilously vulnerable to naval gunfire, they shifted to a more insidious approach. The revised strategy involved mounting their primary defences further inland, with only a limited number of troops near the shore. This tactic aimed to lure the Allies into a maelstrom of sustained, ferocious resistance. Colonel Nakagawa ingeniously leveraged Peleliu's rugged landscape, transforming its extensive cave systems into an elaborate network of bunkers and fortifications. This honeycomb system of interconnected caves, reinforced with steel doors and angled entrances to thwart grenade and flamethrower attacks, turned the island's natural terrain into a colossal fortress. Rather than contesting the beaches, the Japanese planned to cede this territory to the Marines. Once ashore, the Marines would find themselves ensnared in a relentless onslaught from hidden bunkers, tanks, infantry, and hundreds of mortars and guns strategically positioned within the caves. This strategy was designed to resist the American advance and ensnare the Marines in a protracted attritional conflict, where the only path forward was through a gauntlet of fierce, costly battles. Nakagawa also capitalized on the strategic high ground, centering his defenses around Umerbrogel Mountain. This elevated vantage point offered a commanding view over many of the beaches, enabling the Japanese to defend their crucial airstrip from an advantageous position. The beaches themselves were transformed into a perilous maze for the landing craft, laden with mines and heavy artillery shells, primed to detonate upon impact. A battalion was strategically deployed along the shoreline to impede the American push inland, merely a prelude to the true defences that lay in wait within the island's interior. On the other hand, by August 1944, the United States initiated a preemptive campaign. The first to engage were the members of UDT-10, a team of American frogmen, 
tasked with the perilous job of preparing the beaches and lagoons for the impending landings. These brave men, often venturing unarmed into hostile waters, faced risks of an almost unimaginable scale. Operating from USS Burfish, they gathered vital intelligence. Their reconnaissance revealed considerable obstacles, concrete tetrahedrons, a double row of wooden posts 75 yards offshore, barbed wire, horned mines and, notably, areas where the reef lay just two feet below the water's surface at low tide. UDTs 6 and 7 deployed along the beaches three days before the invasion. Their mission was twofold, demolish obstacles and blast wide ramps into the coral for the amphibious craft. This operation, conducted in broad daylight, was fraught with danger. Naval fire support from offshore crisscrossed the sky, while sniper and machine gun fire from the shore targeted the unarmed swimmers in the shallow lagoon. On the eve of the assault, UDTs undertook a nocturnal mission ashore, demolishing rock cribs, posts, barbed wire and concrete cubes, and marking the newly blasted pathways with buoys. The American invasion plan, drawn from previous experiences and successes, was complex, yet meticulously organized. It involved five imaginary parallel lines offshore, staging areas for the task force's ships and troops. At 18,000 yards, the outermost line hosted the larger ships and transports. Closer in, landing ship transports housed troops in their cavernous holds. At 6,000 yards, the LSTs opened their bow doors, releasing the small LVTs, also known as Amtraks. The fourth line, 4,000 yards from shore, served as a rendezvous point for the assault waves. At 2,000 yards, the penultimate line was where Amtrak's regrouped after delivering troops to the beach. At 1,000 yards, the final approach saw the amphibious fleet navigating the reef on their own. Submarine chasers, patrol craft and Higgins boats were overseeing this intricate ballet, using signalling flags and constant radio communication to coordinate the waves. Armoured amphibian tanks, equipped with machine guns and howitzers, were leading the first waves and were tasked with neutralizing beach defenses. Landing craft, infantry and gunboats armed with rockets provided covering fire from the 1,000-yard line. Meanwhile, naval artillery and aircraft bombarded the island from above. The entire operation was a symphony of precision and coordination. Over 17,000 Marines from the 1st Division were chosen to spearhead the operation. Like their Japanese counterparts on Peleliu, these were among the Marine Corps' finest. The impending battle was set to be a clash of titans. Leading the Marines was Major General William Rupertus, whose confidence in a swift victory was unshakable. However, unbeknownst to the US forces, the Japanese had radically altered their defensive strategy. The Americans, planning to employ their tried and tested tactics from previous amphibious assaults, were unaware of the fierce and unexpected resistance awaiting them on the island. After enduring days of relentless US naval and aerial bombardment, Peleliu braced for the inevitable ground assault. At 8.30 a.m. on September 15, 1944, the 1st Marine Division commenced its landing. The 1st Marine Regiment descended onto beaches White 1 and 2, the 5th Marine Regiment onto beaches Orange 1 and 2, and the 7th Marine Regiment onto beach Orange 3. The previous strikes had targeted these beaches, assuming that Japanese defences would be concentrated there, as in past encounters. However, as the Marines disembarked, they were immediately ensnared in a devastating crossfire. Hidden Japanese forces swung open the steel doors of their bunkers, unleashing a barrage of artillery from 47mm guns and 20mm cannons. This fierce onslaught destroyed 60 tracked landing and amphibious vehicles within the first hour. Joe W. Clapper, recalling the landing, likened it to trying to run between raindrops as he dodged Japanese machine gun fire on White Beach. In the midst of this chaos, a young Marine named J.M. Morsi, only 15 years old and known as Junior, saved Clapper's life when he warned him just in time to avoid a Japanese rifle aimed directly at him. The second day brought further tragedy. Clapper witnessed the loss of his friend, Fortune Orlando Rosencrans the Thurai, known as Rosie, who was fatally shot in the chest. The memory of Rosie's demise remained vividly etched in Clapper's mind. Later that day, Clapper himself was wounded by a bullet in the upper left chest. A Navy corpsman attended to his wound before he was evacuated to a hospital ship, leaving behind a beach carpeted with fallen Marines. Meanwhile, Colonel Chesty Puller narrowly avoided an untimely end when a dud artillery round hit his landing vehicle at Orange Beach. 
His communications unit wasn't as fortunate, destroyed by a 47mm round. Amidst coconut groves, the 5th Marines made significant progress, pushing toward the island's airfield. But their advance was soon met with a fierce counterattack. Nakagawa's armored tank company surged across the airfield, desperate to repel the Marine advance. The battle escalated as the Americans retaliated, their firepower amplified by tanks, howitzers, naval guns and dive bombers. This concerted effort swiftly overwhelmed the Japanese counterattack. As dusk fell, the Americans had secured most of the beaches, but their hold extended little beyond that. The cost was steep, 200 Marines killed and 900 wounded. Despite these losses, Major General William Rupertus maintained his confidence, convinced that the Japanese defenses would soon collapse under the relentless American assault. On the second day of battle, the 5th Marines made a concerted push to seize the airfield, advancing towards the eastern shore of Peleliu. Their progress, however, was met with relentless artillery fire raining down from the highlands to the north, inflicting numerous casualties. The Japanese forces were not the sole source of the Marines' suffering. The scorching heat, with temperatures soaring above 115 degrees Fahrenheit, exacted a brutal toll. Many soldiers succumbed to heat exhaustion in their strenuous efforts to overpower the entrenched Japanese positions. Compounding the hardship, the Marines' water supply, contaminated from being stored in oil drums, became a source of illness, further escalating the casualty count. U.S. Navy Corpsman John Bailey, serving under the command of the legendary Marine Colonel Lewis Burwell Chesty Puller in the 1st Marine Regiment, vividly recalled their relentless conditions. The pre-landing bombardment, coupled with ongoing combat, had obliterated most of the trees and foliage that might have offered some respite in shade and cover. Under the unrelenting sun, sunburn and blisters were rampant. The hot, humid climate was so severe that some men's eyes swelled shut. The landscape, littered with sharp coral, presented its own deadly hazard. Flying shards of coral, propelled through the air by bomb and artillery barrages, claimed additional lives. Beyond his duties with the Marines, Bailey also worked with the Graves Registration Service units. His task involved the grim work of finding, identifying, and burying fallen Marines in a temporary cemetery on the island. For Bailey, ensuring the identification of their comrades was a matter of profound importance, a solemn duty to the families who deserved to know the fate of their loved ones. The intensity and constancy of the fighting meant that they could not begin retrieving fallen marines until three to four days after the battle commenced. In Peleliu's punishing climate, the relentless heat rendered many unrecoverable within just two days. The Battle of Peleliu was marked not only by fierce combat, but also by a pervasive, inescapable stench. The decaying American and Japanese soldiers, compounded by the island being used as, in John Bailey's word, quote, one big toilet created an odor so overpowering that marine pilots claimed they could smell the island while flying overhead. Bailey, deeply affected by the brutality and relentless hardship of the conflict, would go on to describe the Battle of Peleliu as, quote, the horror of all battles. Despite the overwhelming adversity, the Marines succeeded in capturing the airfield within the first week. Yet this victory was not without its cost as they faced incessant attacks from Japanese forces entrenched in the island's central mountains. Remarkably, American morale remained high amidst the casualties and setbacks. To the Marines, the capture of Peleliu seemed yet another stride in the long island-hopping campaign inching towards its inevitable conclusion. Utilizing the newly captured airfield to their advantage, the Marines launched aerial strikes across the island. Napalm was dropped into cave entrances, and the jungle was cleared to expose Japanese hiding spots. Marine F-4U Corsair fighter planes conducted close air support missions with such proximity to the ground action that pilots often didn't bother to retract their landing gear. Sorties were swift and intense, some completed in a mere 30 minutes from takeoff to landing. With the strategic airbase under their control, the Marines now faced the Herculean task of rooting out the entrenched Japanese forces. This meant storming every tunnel, bunker and ridge, a relentless endeavor as the Japanese continued to mount fierce counter-offensives against the airfield daily. The US Marines, navigating the treacherous terrain of Peleliu, faced staggering casualties as they inched through the island's ridges and caves. The losses mounted rapidly, further exacerbated by Japanese snipers who ruthlessly targeted U.S. stretcher-bearers. 
These snipers operated under a chilling rationale. Incapacitating the bearers would force more marines to venture into harm's way for their rescue. Nightfall brought no respite as Japanese soldiers infiltrated American lines to launch surprise assaults on the marines in their fighting holes. Adapting to this nocturnal threat, the US forces constructed two-man fighting holes, enabling one marine to sleep while the other stood guard. Amidst this relentless warfare, a particularly brutal encounter unfolded on a ridge that would be grimly christened Bloody Nose. For over six days, the 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, led by Major Raymond Davis, engaged in a desperate struggle to overrun a hill occupied by Japanese forces. The regimental battle history starkly recounts, quote, Mortar and artillery fire began cutting our exposed front lines to ribbons under perfect observation. The 1st Battalion absorbed terrific punishment. As quickly as possible, the assault units were reformed to storm the Japanese out of their emplacements on the bluffs. In a tactical move, Davis summoned M4 Sherman tanks to unleash point-blank fire into cave openings while his riflemen advanced inch by inch. The ascent was a nightmarish ordeal, as historian George Macmillan described, quote, The pockmarked surface offered no secure footing, even in the few level places. It was impossible to dig in. The jagged rocks slashed their shoes and clothes and tore their bodies every time they hit the deck for safety. By the afternoon, C Company on the left flank of 1-1 had secured Hill 150 and part of Hill 180. Simultaneously, a company in the center took control of Hill 160. However, these strategic gains were won at a devastating price. 250 casualties, a company commander lamented, quote, we're up here, but we're knee-deep in Purple Hearts. The brutal contest yielded 35 captured caves, but at an unimaginable human cost, Captain Everett Pope's C Company faced a daunting mission to seize Hill 100. Capturing this crucial terrain would enable the Marines to launch an attack on Bloody Nose Ridge from the rear. Pope, with just 90 men remaining, led a daring infiltration deep into the ridges. After a full day of intense combat, they reached what Pope believed was the summit only to find it was another ridge heavily defended by Japanese soldiers. Outnumbered and isolated, Captain Pope established a small defensive position. Throughout the night, this outpost endured relentless assaults from the Japanese. As their ammunition dwindled, the Marines resorted to desperate measures, fighting with knives fists and even hurling coral rocks and empty ammunition boxes at their attackers. Major Raymond Davis recalled that harrowing night, quote, as twilight fell, the Marines took any cover they could among the jumbled rocks. The Japanese went for Pope's men after dark and they kept coming. Two Japanese suddenly materialized near the position defended by Lieutenant Francis Burke and Sergeant James P. McAlanis. One of the Japanese ran a bayonet into Burke's leg. Burke tore into his attacker, beating him senseless with his fists. McAlanis, meanwhile, went to work on the second Japanese with his rifle butt. As dawn broke, C Company was on the brink of collapse, with only about a dozen men remaining and ammunition nearly exhausted. In the midst of the last Japanese assault, Pope received orders to withdraw. Those who could scrambled down the slope in a desperate retreat. Of the company, only nine men descended safely. Among the wounded was Captain Pope himself, his legs riddled with shrapnel. The valiant stand of C Company marked the end of major operations for Davis's command. On D, plus seven, the battered battalion was pulled back into reserve, having endured a staggering 71% casualty rate. For his extraordinary courage and leadership, Captain Pope would later be awarded the Medal of Honor. The labyrinthine network of ridges and caves sprawling across Peleliu morphed into a deadly quagmire for the Marines as they struggled to ascend the heights of Umerbrogel Mountain. The operation, optimistically estimated to last merely three days, soon stretched into weeks, then months. The anticipated swift victory unraveled into a protracted, grueling campaign. The toll on the 1st Marine Division was catastrophic. The unit was so severely depleted that it remained sidelined until the invasion of Okinawa on April 1st, 1945. During its harrowing month on Peleliu, the division suffered over 6,500 casualties. The 81st Infantry Division, joining the fray, also paid a heavy price, enduring up to 3,300 losses. While the American forces bore a heavy burden, the Japanese defenders suffered even more devastating losses. 
Over 14,000 men were lost, with nearly 10,000 on Peleliu alone and the remainder on nearby islands. The Imperial soldiers under Colonel Kunio Nakagawa's command fought with unyielding ferocity. Nakagawa himself remained until all hope was extinguished, ultimately choosing to end his life through seppuku. The tenacity of the Japanese resistance was epitomized by a lone lieutenant who continued guerrilla operations on the island until 1947, two years after the war's end. It required a retired Japanese commander to finally persuade him that the war was over and it was time to return home. The hellish ordeal of Peleliu, marked by its unprecedented casualty toll and the brutal, horrific conditions endured by the Marines, later ignited severe criticism of the Allied military leadership. General Douglas MacArthur, who had vigorously championed the campaign, and Major General William Rupertus, who had confidently predicted a swift victory within three days, faced particular scrutiny. In the aftermath of the Battle of Peleliu, Major Raymond Davis, who emerged as a hero and was awarded the Navy Cross for his extraordinary heroism, voiced a poignant critique of the strategy employed. He reflected, quote, We could have saved a lot of lives by not trying to take the whole island. After we secured the airfield, we should have pulled back, got into a siege stage, got our guns up, and just pounded the place. The battle stirred controversy within the United States, not only due to the enormous casualties, but also because of a growing realization that Peleliu may have held little strategic value. Further analysis suggested that the Japanese forces on the island were ill-equipped to disrupt U.S. operations in the Philippines. Additionally, the captured airfield played no significant role in the Philippines' invasion. Instead, the Ulithi Atoll in the Caroline Islands served as the staging base for the invasion of Okinawa. Limited media coverage of the battle somewhat mitigated the potential for scandal. Part of this was due to Rupertus's initial prediction of a swift three-day victory, which attracted only a handful of reporters. Moreover, the battle was overshadowed by the Allies' concurrent advances towards Germany in Europe. This convergence of factors meant that one of the most brutal engagements faced by the Marines during World War II remained largely out of the public eye for many years. The hidden nature of the conflict with much of the brutal fighting unfolding in the island's cave systems, led to another tragic consequence. Many US servicemen who lost their lives in these caves were never recovered. To this day, over 2,600 troops remain unaccounted for. Recent initiatives have been undertaken to reopen some of the sealed caves in an effort to recover and honor those who sacrificed their lives in what stands as one of the most harrowing battles in human history.